Amen. That's a tough act to follow. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Son, Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, as we wrestle with your word and what it means to magnify God's love today, Lord, we pray that you transform our hearts and minds and allow us to be receptive to your word, Lord. And I pray more this morning, Lord, that you just let my words be your words, Lord, and that you push out any distractions, anything that would keep us from hearing the truth, the mercy, and the grace that we need to hear. And it's in the glorious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well, pastor and theologian John Piper, in this article titled, How to Magnify God, wrote the following about magnifying the love and glory of God. He said this, he says, there are two kinds of magnifying. There's the microscope magnifying and the telescope magnifying. He says, the microscope one makes a small thing look bigger than it really is. But the telescope, it makes a big thing begin to look as big as it really is. And he said, when David says, I will magnify God with thanksgiving, he does not mean I will make a small God look bigger than he really is. He means I will make a big God begin to look as big as he really is. We're not called to be microscopes. We are called to be telescopes. Piper goes on to say, Christians are not called to be con men who magnify their product all out of proportion to reality when they know that the competitor's product is far superior. There's nothing and nobody superior to God and his love. And so the calling of those who love God is to make his greatness begin to look as great as it really is. That's why we exist, why we were saved, as Peter says in 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. And he concluded by saying this, the whole duty of the Christian can be summed up in this. Feel, think, and act in a way that will make God look as great as he really is. Be a telescope for the world of the infinite starry wealth of the glory and love of God. I love that quote because what Piper does for us is he captures for us, as we will see in our text this morning, is that God's people have been called to live collectively, corporately, in a way that magnifies the love of God to the lost world. And as God's people, right, we're called to live into this new identity, this new mission to magnify and illuminate God's love. We're called, brothers and sisters, to be telescopes that magnify God's love by pointing others to Christ. And today, we're going to be concluding and wrapping up our series, Crazy Love. And last week, you heard Suze teach you about how to love our neighbors and how we magnify God's love by loving our enemies, excuse me, loving our enemies who can be our neighbors sometimes. <laughs> I have no, that, that didn't go over well. Oh, well. Thank you, God, for a sense of humor. <laughs> Today, we're going to discuss what it means to live in a way that magnifies God's deep and profound love. So I know we heard the scriptures again, but let's go there again. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, the version I'm going to be reading to you from here. So hear now the word of the Lord. Peter says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you, 
as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, wage war that wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. To really wrestle with this text, I need to give you just a little bit more of context. And Peter writes this epistle. He writes this book to encourage believers to live into their calling as God's chosen people, regardless of their situation. Because at this time, the people he's writing to are facing persecution for their faith. And so what he's doing is he's saying, hey, you are to live into your salvation daily. That is your hope. And you are to live into a daily in a way that magnifies and points others to the greatness and the glory of the God that we serve. We are to magnify the love of Christ. We are to live as exiles in a world that is hostile to the gospel message. And we are to bear witness to this message when we live in a way that's obedient to God's word and in a way that pleases God. But here's the thing. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we struggle to do this now in the 21st century, right? And we struggle because we are tempted in our very individualistic culture. We are tempted to try to magnify ourselves. And so instead of living in a way that makes the name of God and the love of God look great, I think we try to live in a way that makes ourselves look great, but that's not our calling. See, Peter challenges us to live a life that magnifies Christ, which is demonstrated by a heart that wants more of Jesus and less of ourselves. See, we need to live in a way that increases the name of Jesus and decreases our love for ourselves. And I think John the Baptist, he captures this perfectly in John chapter 3, verse 30. What does he say? He says, he must increase. He's referencing Jesus, but I must decrease. See, our big idea this morning is that because God loved us by choosing us as his people, we must magnify his love by living lives that glorify the name of Christ and not our own. And that's the temptation we face. But how do we do this? How do we live lives that magnify the deep, profound, and crazy love of God? Well, we do it in two ways. The first way is this. We have to embrace our new identity. And then two, we must have, live into that identity by living out our new calling. In this text, we were given a new identity. We were given a calling. So I just want to paint this picture. What does it mean for us in this first point to embrace our new identity? Let's just look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Just the first part of verse 9 says this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Did you catch our new identity? And I say our not yours, because we are to do this together. This is a corporate identity. We're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, holy, and we belong to God. Let's break that down real quick. What does it mean that we're a chosen race? It implies that God's people are called and chosen by him by him alone. And the basis of this election, the basis of this choosing is God's grace. It's nothing that we bring to the table. This is why Paul tells us that no man can boast in his salvation except in Christ alone. Christ is the mover in our salvation. And so God's choosing of us is not based on our merit. It's not based on some sort of superior intellect. It's not based on our talents, our abilities. It's not some sort of superior might. It's not our military and political power or allegiances. It's not even about the number of people. It's not even about our ethnicity. Our election is purely rooted in God's love for us. 
We see this in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. What does it say? It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. The same applies for us today. Before Christ entered into our lives, we were enemies of God. We were spiritual orphans. We were drifters lost in our sin without an identity. But because of what Christ does on the cross, we've now been adopted. We have become children of God. That means we are loved by God. We're delivered by God. We're made holy by God. And as we see in this passage, God will even invite us to do and partake in his mission to be used by God for the sake of being a vehicle of blessing. And then Peter draws on this. He says, okay, you're chosen, but you're also royal. You're a royal priesthood. I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning to look in the mirror, I don't feel like a king or some sort of royal person. That's a tough one to sit with. Peter draws on this idea in the Old Testament that God's people had a special class of priest who mediated the blessings of God to the people of God. But now, but now, because of Jesus Christ, because he's our great high priest, and because the Spirit of God dwells in us, each believer, and because we're united to Christ, the people of God are called to mediate blessings to the world. This is the priesthood of all believers. And we're to do this by promoting the name of Christ through evangelism, through teaching God's word. We exist to serve the king of the universe so his love is magnified. Each and every person here is an ambassador for Christ. You are called in everything you do. Wherever God has got you planted, you are called to be a blessing to the world. You are to proclaim the excellencies of Christ. We are to proclaim Christ and to live for Christ. And then he tells us we're a holy nation. Notice the adjective before nation. Notice the type of nation we are to be. It's not marked by location or ethnicity, but it's marked by character. To be holy is to be Christ-like. You see, holiness for Christians on earth is to reflect to mirror the character of God and the virtue of Christ before the watching world. See, holiness in Christ-likeness is a way of life. And so what does it mean to be Christ-like? It means that we love our neighbors as ourselves. It means we love our brothers and sisters. And as Sue's taught us last week, it means we even love our enemies. We demonstrate respect within our family and community. And we have this exclusive loyalty to Christ. We demonstrate economic generosity. We observe the word of God and obeying commandments. We demonstrate social compassion on the disabled, the less fortunate, the downtrodden. We demonstrate integrity and truth. Our quality of life must reflect Christ integrity. We are called to behave different in every dimension of our personal and social lives in order to magnify the love of Christ and not ourselves. You see, the church is called to be a sanctified people set apart for God's mission. It's like the people of God are to be a people on display. But hear me on this. People on display live in a way that witnesses to how a relationship with Jesus Christ changes and transforms us. It's not about you. The way we live and conduct ourselves is to magnify the love of God so others may be drawn into the kingdom. Our holiness does not exist for ourselves to make us look great, but once again, our holiness is actually a witness to the truth of God's deep love that he has for his people. 
And then what gets even better in this verse is that he says we are his possession. God has made us into a new community of believers. How did he do this? By redeeming us from the wages of our sin, by adopting us as his sons and daughters. We have switched from being outsiders to being the ultimate insiders. We are now his family and his children. And he has set his love upon us, and we don't deserve it. He made us into a new community that restores community while representing Christ. That's our mission. And so not only must we embrace our new identity, brothers and sisters, but we have to live into that identity by living out our new calling. So what is our new calling? Let's pick it up from the second part of verse 9. It says this, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Our calling is to tell the world about Jesus. It doesn't mean you have to stand up here at a pulpit and do it. But God gives each and every one of you these unique opportunities to point to the love of Christ. So what does it mean for us to proclaim Christ? The church exists not for itself, but for the life of the world, bearing witness and testimony to what God has done and will continue to do through Jesus Christ. We are called to tell the world that Jesus Christ is the hero of history. Everything in history is moving towards and pointing us to Christ. And the church exists to exalt and magnify Jesus' name. And we do this by leveraging our resources to make Christ known. I mean, I just think about this summer already. We don't host vacation Bible schools, soccer camps, or go on mission trips, or senior trips, and bunco nights, and all these different things that we do just to provide these great programs. The purpose of these programs is so that the gospel of Jesus Christ can be proclaimed, so that there's opportunities for us to magnify the love of God. We are to proclaim that Jesus is the righteous one. He is the one who lived the life we should have. He died the death we deserved in our place. And we're to proclaim this truth because by doing this, we will magnify the love of God. And in doing so, we will call people. God will use that to call people out of the darkness and into the light. One of the best arguments for the existence of God is a life lived in obedience to God's word. And when we proclaim this truth and live this truth out and people see it in our lives, it is one of the best cases and arguments for why people should love Christ. And then it tells us that we're called from darkness to light. This describes the message that we're to tell the world. Jesus has delivered us, right? He's delivered us from the darkness of sin and brokenness, and he's brought us into the marvelous light. He has brought us to himself. He is himself the light of the world. And when Jesus lives inside of us, we carry this light to the work of the Holy Spirit, and we can take it to others who live in the darkness. Jesus is the one. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And when it speaks to Jesus being the light, it refers to the way of Jesus, the truth of Jesus. It refers to his righteousness, his justice, his peace, his mercy, his grace, and his wholeness. And we are to take this on as God's people and reflect it so we can magnify the love of God. And then it says, we've received mercy. We once did not receive mercy, but now we have received mercy. We must remember as God's people where we once were and where we are now. You once didn't receive mercy, but through Christ you now have. And as such, we have to live out the story that we are God's redeemed people who are to represent Christ in all that we do so that we can restore 
the broken community all around us. And we respond to God's mercy by living obedient lives so attractive that our non-believing neighbors can do nothing but, as Peter said, but give glory to God, even when they try to condemn us, even when they make fun of us for the life that we live. When the people of God reflect the character of God in active obedience, then like a telescope, we show the world just how big, deep, and profound God's love is. I want to share with you all, as I wrap up this morning, I want to share with you all how this week I watched 33 high school students and youth leaders magnify God's love like a telescope in Benton Harbor, Michigan. That group changed my life this week. There was only seven of us. We had four students and three leaders go. We partnered with two other churches from Minnesota, Easter Lutheran Church and Christ Presbyterian in Minnesota. And with those people this past week, we served and got to see God do some amazing things. And through each and every one of those individuals, I had the privilege and honor of just watching how God was working in and through their lives to magnify his love. Here's how I want to describe it for you. I saw our students leave their comfort zones and pray for people they barely knew. I mean, it just blew me away. I saw one of our students lead 32 other students in worship, and I saw that same student lead all of the other students, pack 23 pallets of meals for low-income seniors in the Benton Harbor community. She was particularly chosen by the warehouse manager because he saw how good of a leader and how meticulous she was at making sure things were packed correctly. I watched each and every one of our high school students pray for each other, encourage each other to grow in their faith and their service to their community. I watched students come out of their shells and comfort zones as they engaged strangers and made new friends with community members in Benton Harbor. I watched students forge bonds and partner with students from other churches to serve a community. I had two leaders put up with my driving and also lead and serve our students and even students from other churches with such compassion and patience. I learned from one of our missionary partners that partners with YouthWorks. His name was Jerry. This guy was amazing. His story just blew me away. I've never seen someone love a community more than Jerry did. Jerry literally moved back and gave his life for this community so they could experience Christ's grace and mercy to transform this community. From another missionary partner, Sharon, she taught me to be curious, to seek godly wisdom. She says, you know, if a community doesn't have a vision, it will perish. To see the work she's doing to paint a vision for this community that was downtrodden, to show them who they really are so they could thrive and reflect the glory of God. I learned from the youth work staff, Aaron, Tamaya, and Emily, how to lead with compassion and patience as they served us food. They led us in worship. They led us in devotionals. And on the last night they were there, they even washed our feet. It was during this week that I saw that small, consistent moments reminded me that magnifying God's love is a process, not an event. Sharon, who I mentioned before, one of the ministry partners in Benton Harbor, she shared with our students how our impact is like that of a boxer when we serve on mission. I thought this was profound. She says, you don't want to come out and try to land a right hook right away, but methodically and strategically, we make strategic jabs that punch holes in the darkness. This week on a mission trip, brothers and sisters, I learned that mission work is not something we do at certain times and places. It's a way of life, just as this passage tells us. And when we embrace that calling, like a telescope, we magnify to the watching world just how big God's love is.
God's love was magnified in a way that I haven't seen in a long time this week. And I pray for all of you that you live into this calling. Remember your identity. Remember the love that God has set upon each and every one of you, and now he's brought you into this community. So let us lock arms together and let us restore community while we represent Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, remind us each day, every hour, and every minute that we are chosen, that we belong to you, and that you have made us into holy people and royal priests, people that can magnify the greatness of your love. And Lord, through your Spirit, empower each and every one of us, equip us to live in such a way that the world can see how the love of God has transformed us from the inside out. Lord, help inspire our witness this morning that all may know the power of your forgiveness and the hope of the resurrection. And it's in your glorious name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us continue to worship as we sing Church of God, Elect and Glorious.